Good morning, everybody. As always, we're just giving it a moment for you all to join into the webinar today. We have a really important topic uh, and I expect uh, we'll have a number of questions, uh, but as usual, we wanna get into our updates. Before we do that, just wanted to acknowledge that this upcoming Monday is Martin Luther King, uh, the MLK holiday. And in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, we wanted to highlight uh, a really interesting uh, film documentary film festival called Where Do We Go From Here? It's actually hosted by our Stanford Research and Education Institute here. And uh, it starts on Friday evening and goes through Monday into to the holiday. I'm gonna send a link out to that as well. Thank you to Dr. Nadeau, um, her administrative assistant, Tina Wynn, and, and Dr. Mm -hmm. Mays for bringing that to our attention. And so thank you so much for that. And uh, also on that note, uh, I will be giving you updates on future medical ground rounds in February. We will be honoring uh, um, African-American um, celebrating our black scientists and clinicians with a whole lineup the whole month, uh, really focusing on those various topics and hearing from various leaders within the community. So we're really excited to share that upcoming as well. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Will Collins to provide our usual weekly updates. Okay, can you see this? All right, so um, I'll get started. I'm gonna jump right in. Um, if I can get my slides to my there we go. So I'll just start uh, directly with talking about what's been happening here in the Bay Area. So this is both the curve for hospitalizations per 100,000 and uh, those in the ICU per 100,000. And you can see that actually in the recent week, there is a little bit of leveling out of the curve. So hopefully that's something that continue that can continue. Um, this is similar to at least in terms of case rates seen in uh, California, although nationally and worldwide cases have uh, started to go up again. Uh, for Stanford itself, uh, as far as positive cases by week in our overall census, we've also seen a little bit of leveling out in recent days and weeks, um, including in terms of our, our ICU volumes. And this is broken out here in the chart below, looking at both our COVID positive and COVID cleared, which uh, just to remind folks is those patients who have had sufficient time since their diagnosis that they're no longer considered uh, in need of isolation. Um, so you can see as of Monday, um, that total number was 112 and yesterday it was 107. Uh, as far as sources of admission, uh, since uh, November 1st, um, a good majority of our patients uh, who have been COVID positive or are since become COVID cleared have come through the ED or by direct admission. Uh, that number is 247. Um, we've also taken 65 transfers. And as far as uh, adult inpatient demographics, this is now through January 10th. Um, we identified uh, 1,114 uh, patients seen at Stanford and an, an additional 233 at Valley Care. Uh, and uh, of the Stanford patients, uh, we still have a rate of about 22% requiring ICU level care at some point in their admission. Uh, just under 6% uh, have passed away, um, a little bit higher female than male ratio as before, and our age range, again, slightly skewed towards older, but fairly wide, and uh, the most uh, affected uh, individuals have been of Hispanic or Latinx ethnicity, followed by non-Hispanic white. Uh, we looked again at our, our length of stay and updated the numbers as well as 30-day readmissions, um, now identified... Um, uh, 1,011 COVID patients uh, discharged as of January 3rd. Uh, median length of stay was the same still at 4.1 days. Um, and then looking at 30-day readmissions, uh, we actually went back a little bit and uh, so that uh, they were discharged as of uh, December 12th. Uh, that allows a 30-day observation window to make sure uh, of whether or not they had a readmission. Uh, that was a total of 675 patients and we identified 63 uh, with an admission within 30 days of their initial discharge, uh, which is a rate of 9.3%. We did also look at uh, the rates over time. I'm not showing that, but uh, the rates have been relatively constant over time for both length of stay and 30 day readmissions at Stanford. Um, so thanks to everyone, especially uh, Isabel and Salma who do a lot of work uh, every week helping get these numbers together. And I'm gonna stop sharing, turn it over to the next person. Thank you so much, Dr. Collins, and Dr. Huja will talk about our current surge response. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to build off of what I shared last week just to keep things brief because we have a great uh, Grand Rounds lineup and I don't want to take too much time. But, um, you know, like Dr. Collins showed, we did have a slight bit of leveling of the volumes for COVID, which then fortunately helped our surge teams. Today, we have six medicine ward teams 
and two COVID surge teams active as you see here. And as you recall, we had planned for up to eight surge teams. We always wanna be over-prepared just in case. And we are currently at these two teams and we're talking amongst ourselves in the next 48 hours or by the end of this week, how we might slightly decompress some of the surge teams um, in terms of staffing so that we're prepared for a potential post New Year's uh, surge the third week of January, but we're also not over utilizing uh, services if our volumes aren't too high. So more to come on that. And like I said, these were the two um, surge teams that are active. And I really wanna acknowledge ENT, orthopedics and psychiatry for providing their house staff to our medicine house staff to complete these surge teams. We learned as these uh, individuals started that there was a lot of great interdisciplinary teaching and learning. The psychiatry fellow wanted to learn point of care ultrasound from Andre Kumar, who was the hospitalist staffing that team. The ENT PGY3 resident was teaching things to the uh, medicine resident. So it's just been a really nice um, collaboration. And you know, Dr. Bill Maloney came by, checked in on the team, on his intern as well. So I really appreciate all of the support from all the different departments. Just one thing we want to keep in mind is as we think about slowly deactivating teams, you know, there will be a large volume of ICU patients with COVID that will come to the wards and have a potentially long length of stay. I, patients that go to the ICU and stay there for some time, as many have, you know, are deconditioned, et cetera, and take some time before they can be discharged or transferred to a skilled nursing facility. We talked about the post New Year surge, which, you know, may still happen in another week. And then finally, we are seeing that um, individuals who have had the second vaccine dose are much more symptomatic than they were with the initial dose. So just keeping provider um, you know, illness or provider loss for a day or two in, in mind as we consider staffing. And then next week, surgical cases are slowly going to increase as well as other procedural cases. And so we wanna be mindful of those services who have contributed house staff to the surge teams, but knowing that they will need them back soon. Um, and then finally, our ICU surge team, they had three teams active and just deactivated the third surge team yesterday. So they'll keep a close eye on their volumes. And again, we remain appreciative to all the departments that you see listed here for their contributions in staffing the surge. With that, I will end and I wanna thank all the uh, groups and individuals you see on this slide and I'll turn it back over to you, Errol. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Huja, and I share in the thanks to all the faculty and health staff that have been helping with the search staff. One of the um, uh, big things we're going to be emphasizing throughout the year, so and acknowledging those of, who have been doing that. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bowman from Occupational Health. Thank you for uh, being with us this morning. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, real quick, I'll just summarize from the uh, occupational health point of view. Our new infection rate among our employees appears to have plateaued and actually has been declining a bit over the last couple of weeks, from a peak of maybe. 130 a week a few weeks ago to about 100 a week uh, in the last week. Um, and hopefully that's reflecting some leveling off in the community. It may also be reflecting, uh, Paul will I think say that we're up to something close to 20,000 employees vaccinated. And as we get further out from that, even that first dose of vaccination, we're probably seeing some protective effects. So hopefully those numbers will continue to decline. Um, meanwhile, uh, the color testing, as you know, is up and running as of last week. Uh, this week, so far, we're seeing about 600 tests a day. I would encourage everybody to uh, participate in color, but also to remember we don't want people who are symptomatic to go through color testing. We want them to please call us or drop in at the Hoover testing site anytime that they're open, eight to five, Monday through Saturday, basically. And remember also we have a rapid or urgent testing pathway for folks who are really needed uh, uh, clinically and can't be out for a day, we can get you tested very quickly. And there is a, 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 a line, if you call a page operator and ask for the urgent COVID testing line, they'll hook you up with that alternative. Um, I think that's basically it, folks. Uh, I would just say, you know, even though we're seeing a decline in our numbers, and it's very welcome, uh, I will just remind folks, there's still never been a better time not to get COVID especially as you're between your first and second dose, et cetera. Uh, stay safe, be careful. It's not time to let up on any of our social distancing or PPE policies. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. And updating more on the vaccine, uh, Dr. Maggio, thank you for being with us as well. Thank you, Earl. Let me bring my screen up here. Uh, 
Okay. In terms of um, an update from the vaccination program, do you see my screen? It seems to be frozen. Yes. It's not in full screen mode, but I, we can see it. Yeah, hold on one second. I apologize for that. I don't know why my computer is um, not going through. Let me try one more time. And if not, then I'll just read the numbers for you. Yeah, it's not uh, going. I'll give you a brief update. Sorry, I apologize. I won't be able to show you the slides. But um, just an update. Yesterday was our busiest um, day in the um, uh, atrium, as many of you may have recognized that are working at 300P. And as Brian pointed out, we are now approaching uh, 20,000 individuals that have been uh, vaccinated. Certainly by the end of the week, we will surpass that. One comment about the waves that most of us are familiar with for uh, healthcare workers at Stanford. As of Friday, an important milestone, all of the invitations for the three waves should have gone out by now. So all healthcare workers at Stanford should now have been invited. That's allowed us to focus some of our attention on working with the county now. So uh, with a separate allotment of vaccines, we are now beginning to vaccinate healthcare workers uh, down in the South Bay. Uh, that clinic is actually opening up today. Uh, we have 150 people schedule, scheduled for today, and that is expected to ramp up very quickly to over 500 per day, uh, certainly by next week. Uh, that takes me uh, to my second point. Uh, many are aware uh, probably, be, probably of the federal government recommendations that were presented yesterday. Uh, part of that was expanding our groups to include those over 65 and those younger than 65 with comorbidities. So again, just a reminder, we take our guidance from the state and county. So we did talk to the county last night. They have uh, agreed to open up uh, vaccines for those 75 and older. We are still waiting for some guidance to come through from the state today. But because of that, we are now planning to one, uh, convert uh, our South Bay site to 75 and older in the near future. And we are planning for a second site in Santa Clara County. Um, that site and the timing of the opening, although it will be soon, uh, is yet to be determined. So that's my update for this morning. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much, Dr. Maggio. And thanks for the panelists to helping, for helping answering uh, many of the questions that are popping up right now. Uh, with that being said, I would like to briefly just mention that uh, next week we have Dr. Kevin Shulman, who will be speaking on uh, Inauguration Day on health policy in the Biden era. Uh, the presentation, which of course, will start at eight as usual, and we will end right by nine. I understand uh, nine o'clock is the swearing in of the president elect, and the president will give a speech right after that. So hopefully, the timing should work out well next week. And the following weeks after that, we have Dr. Topol, and then in uh, February, we'll be starting with Dr. with Dr. Michelle Albert to talk about disparities uh, in medicine and COVID, particularly in COVID. This week or today, I'd like to present three. We have three wonderful presenters for today talking about mRNA vaccines and COVID-19. Thank you so much for um, doc these doctors for being with us today. I have to say, I spent more time last night trying to figure out what I can't mention because there's I could easily spend this whole time talking about uh, the credentials of our speakers today. Uh, but I'd like to say a little bit to acknowledge them. First, I'd like to start by uh, welcoming Dr. Harry Greenberg. Dr. Greenberg is the Joseph D. Grant Professor in the School of Medicine and Professor of Microbiology and Immunology, as well as Gastroenterology and Hepatology. He's the Associate Dean for Research, uh, Co-Director of the Spectrum, the Center for uh, Clinical and Translational Science, or the CTSA. He was the lead inventor for the first generation uh, vaccine for the rotavirus, a severe diarrheal disease that's killed between 300 to 400,000 children every year in the developing world. And his studies have been directly involved with viruses that infect the GI tract, the liver, and the respiratory tree focused much of his efforts on studies of the rotavirus, but it's also worked in areas with hepatitis B, C, norovirus, influenza virus, and his work has spanned the spectrum of basic studies throughout viral host cell interactions and translations in regards to the immune response uh, and, and pathogens in, in both human and animal models. So um, really happy to have Dr. Greenberg with us today. So thank you so much. For those of you who have been uh, regularly coming to our Grand Rounds through the past year, if you hadn't known of Dr. Bali Palindran, you probably do now. Dr. Palindran has definitely been very, very busy this year. I could see from uh, seeing him on the news and being invited to give presentation after presentation in multiple institutions. Uh, he is the Violetta uh, L. Horton Professor and Professor of Microbiology and Immunology. He is the director, uh, he was a director of the Innate Immunity Program at the NIH U Center uh, Systems in Emory. Uh, he focuses on, um, uh, he, he fo well, he's, he's published in many frontline journals from Nature, Solid Science, and focuses the understanding on the mechanism which innate 
immune systems regulate the adaptive immunity and harnessing such mechanisms for the design of novel vaccines against the global pandemics. Dr. Palenjian has been one of the key people that we relied on uh, over and over this past year to better understand what's going on in the pandemic in regards to the immunological mechanisms and the vaccine's response to it. So thank you so much, Dr. Palenjian, for being with us today. And lastly, Dr. Pari Nadeau, who is the Natasee Foundation Endowed Professor for Medicine and Pediatrics. She's the director of the Sean uh, N. Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research. She's the section chief for the Asthma and Allergy and Pulmonary in, in the Division of Pulmonary um, Allergy and Critical Care Division. She's a senior director of clinical research for our division of hospital medicine, which has been an absolute pleasure to have join our division. For the last 30 years, she's devoted herself to understanding environmental and immune genetic factors that affect allergies, the immune tolerance, and asthma. And she's been leading research in oncology, transport, transplant, infectious disease, now COVID, and autoimmune trials. Doctor, I just want to say personally, Dr. Nadeau has been someone I constantly ask questions and rely on this past year. This is her also third grand rounds this past time, whether it's been a pandemic or uh, wildfires ramping through our, our Bay Area, she stepped up and, and led grand rounds on it. I've gotten, I've gotten so used to reaching out to Dr. Nadeau every time there's an issue. Last week, I lost my keys and my first instinct was to call Kari to ask what I should do about it. So thank you so much for being with us and being such a, a foundation this past year. Thank you to all three of our presenters. And with that, I will turn it over to you guys. Thank you so much, Errol. That was really uh, an amazing introduction. Just going to share my screen. And uh, I feel very lucky today to be able to be joined by our colleagues, um, Harry Greenberg, Bali, Lundgren, and um, I'll be speaking last. So our outline is to speak about efficacy first. And Dr. Greenberg will speak about the efficacy of both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine as used by the FDA briefing documents that allowed for their EUA. Um, acceptance. And then Bali will speak about the immunology and mechanisms involved in mRNA vaccines. And then I'll speak about the safety and allergic reactions. And most importantly, is we'll leave time for questions at the end. So Harry, if you don't mind taking over, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kari. Thank you, Errol, for that very kind introduction. Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview of both, vac of both of the RNA vaccines. This, this um, session is going to focus on the two RNA vaccines, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna uh, vaccine. I frequently say the Pfizer vaccine rather than the Pfizer-BioNTech just because it's easier to say. But um, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is, is a collaboration between two companies. So can I have the next slide? So the presentation, here's the outline. I'm gonna go over a couple of preclinical basic discoveries initially, because as, as you all know, almost every important therapeutic advance is preceded by a lot of basic science. And this is very much the case with RNA vaccination. Whoops, hold it, sorry. Um, um, and uh, then the, how the, uh, the candidate was selected. And then I'm going to talk about vaccine efficacy data. And finally, I'll have some concluding remarks and try to tee up a couple of remaining issues, which I'm sure will generate questions at the end. Next slide, please. So I'm sorry here, just trying to uh, deal with my telephone. So I, 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 I'm sorry. I hope that's not my wife. Um, hold on. So um, these are the companies that I consult for. I've bolded two um, companies, Pfizer, which you obviously know about, and Bharat, which is a biotech company in India, both of which have COVID programs. I consult for all of these. Thanks. Next. So um, um, some of you may not know about a few, and there are more, um, selected basic science uh, discoveries that really lay the foundation for RNA uh, um, use as a vaccine. The first goes back a long time, way back to 1989, when Felgner and Vermeer, um, as, as doing an experiment where an RNA transfection was a control for DNA transfection, found out that you can actually get protein expression if you transfected RNA. Uh, that was very, um, uh, that started um, the use of nucleic acids as a uh, expression vector directly. Um, next were, were um, ones that um, really haven't gotten as much credit as they ought to. Weissman and Carrico from the University of Pennsylvania in 2008 
who really did fundamental work figuring out how you could stabilize messenger RNA so it became more non-immunogenic and increase the translational ability and its uh, stability. And then finally, uh, much more recently, Barney Graham and his colleagues at the NIH in the intramural program realized where well, they were working on MERS COVID uh, virus and realized that the spike protein of, of MERS could be stabilized in its trimeric form by making a few critical mutations. And that greatly enhanced the ability to use it as an immunogen. Next slide, please. So you've seen slides like this before. When Pfizer got in and BioNTech got into the idea of making a vaccine, in all cases, they actually had four separate vaccines that they investigated. Two vaccines that were just the receptor binding domain of the spike protein of the COVID virus, one that was the entire spike protein, and one actually which was the entire spike protein um, as a self-replicating RNA. The, the entire spike proteins were all stabilized using the uh, Barney Graham mutations. And I won't go into the data, but they decided after down selection that that 162B2, the uh, mutated entire spike protein, um, was their choice. And so they went from there. Next slide, please. And so again, I think most of you were aware there's a lot of required pre-human um, study um, toxicity uh, uh, experiments that are done on almost all um, uh, biologics and pharmaceuticals. And that's certainly the case uh, for the COVID vaccine. Um, all the animal toxicities have been done with both and they came out fine, um, especially for the Pfizer vaccine. And I think for the Moderna too, um, studies of the effective vaccination on fertility and theatrogenicity are still pending for both. I don't expect that either of them to have a problem, but those are long-term studies generally done in rats and those are expected. I mean, the results may be out already, but I don't know them. And then finally, you, uh, you obviously don't go into humans if your vaccine can't do a, uh, an appropriate immune response in animals. And so um, uh, the, the Pfizer and the, um, and the Moderna vaccine were tested in, in primates. And I just want to say, and I'm not going to go over that data, it's all published, but um, the Pfizer vaccine, for example, really did a very good job of protecting rhesus monkeys from a virulent COVID-19 um, challenge um, with complete protection of the lungs. But as in part of that study, it was became clear that there was some infection in the immun, immunized animals, although no symptoms, uh, of the upper airway. So there was not complete protection from reinfection in the monkey studies. Now you'll see later, we really don't know how good either vaccine is in protecting from infection versus disease. Next slide, please. So um, uh, that led to phase one studies, uh, very phase one, very small exploratory studies in humans. The, the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, did two studies, one in Germany and one in the United States is outlined here, just 12 um, active vaccinations and a couple of uh, uh, controls. And in those studies, um, safety and immunogenicity were shown one thing that I want to remind you about, which is a, as best I can tell, a difference um, thus far between uh, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. It was very clear in these early studies that there was a, a, red, a relatively easily detectable T cell response, CD4 and CD8, in the Pfizer vaccine. And that didn't seem to be so obvious in Moderna. I think we'll know a lot more of that pretty uh, soon. It's not easy for me to understand why that would be the case. I would assume that as more investigation goes on, both T cell and B cell uh, responses will be seen. Um, and then of course, those studies um, studied reactogenicity. Next slide, please. So the really nice thing um, about those early studies was that as um, uh, normally the coin of the realm for vaccines is the ability of a vaccine to elicit antibodies that have an antimicrobial effect in some in vitro assay, usually for viruses called a neutralization assay. And, and for those of you who don't know what that is, you simply take your virus in question, add, add antibody to it, put it in cell culture and see whether you kill it. 
it's amazingly it's amazing how useful and predictive that test has been to correlate with protection in humans. In any case, uh, the Pfizer vaccine uh, after two shots, not after one shot there, you see at 21 days, that's one in, uh, immunization, very little immune response. After two uh, immunizations, both in old and young people, um, you got antibody responses that were just a bit higher than the uh, average antibody response from COVID um, disease. Next slide, please. So that was a good prognostic sign. So uh, Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna went full speed ahead. And uh, here, I'm simply going to show you the, what Pfizer did. They, they found that 30 micrograms of RNA was a dose that gave them a good response with not too much reactogenicity. Actually, interestingly, Moderna uses 100 micrograms um, for their choice. Um, and two doses, clearly a booster response was, was clearly advantageous in both uh, studies. Um, it's the, the vaccine is dispensed in small, in small dose multivial uh, uh, dispensing. And as you all know, the Pfizer vaccine requires um, for storage, very cold temperatures, uh, minus 80 centigrade to minus 60 degrees centigrade. The Moderna virus is, uh, vaccine is more stable at warmer temperatures. Um, actually, as best I know, one of the reasons the Pfizer, um, because they were in such a hurry, they didn't do stability studies at, at warmer temperatures that would permit licensure. So they're running to do that now. Um, so when they sought their EUA, the only data for stability they had was at this minus 60 to minus 80. It's possible that they may be able to get by with uh, warmer temperatures, but that's not known. Um, and the other big difference between um, Pfizer and Moderna is for whatever reason, Pfizer started to uh, study ch children, people 16 and older, and Moderna started at 18. Next slide, please. So they um, both companies embarked on really massive phase three vaccine studies. These are pretty big, really big vaccine studies, uh, much bigger than uh, it used to be to prove efficacy, both of them uh, in the 40,000 uh, subject range. And here is uh, uh, sort of the demographics of the phase two, three study from Pfizer. And I, the only thing I want to say is there's um, uh, relative diversity in, in sex of the people studied, in the age of the people studied, somewhat in, in ethnicity, although I would say there's not as many African Americans as, as would probably be optimal. And, but the thing that uh, actually personally I'm happy about because is the older people, um, there's a pretty good uh, representation of age, uh, 65 uh, to above 75, over, over 9,000 subjects in that study, a little over 20% of, of the study population. Next slide, please. And this, this um, uh, I guess this would be called a reverse Kaplan-Meier plot, but you've all, I think most of you have seen this plot. This is, I wish I ever had an experiment that looked this good. Um, it, it's almost, uh, it's hard, it looks like they fudged it um, to me, but obviously they didn't. But in any case, what you see here is the red going up are the cases of uh, symptomatic COVID in the placebo vaccinees. And what you see in the blue is the vaccinees. And um, the first dose happened at day zero. I'm sorry, I don't have arrows here. And the second dose at day 21. And the black, where you see black, those are severe cases. And the most important, the, the, one of the things that is most interesting to me is actually you do get a hint of immunity happening after first dose. You can see around day 12, the lines begin to diverge. And of course, after the 21, they really diverge with only one, one case after the second dose. Um, so, and that's probably through true for Moderna, although you'll see it's hard to see that from their data. But in any case, this is highly protective um, data and induced reasonably quickly. We have no way of knowing since you, the only um, data on a single dose is occurring there, as you can see, up until day 21. After that, everybody had two doses. So the idea that you could give one dose and have a dose sparing, I, I would say the data, that was, a, a, to me, not the smartest idea. Um, um, uh, as a, but 
uh, in any case, it doesn't look like we're doing going to be doing that. Next slide, please. So very quickly, the, the, the huge 40 plus thousand, uh, this data has been published, very high efficacy, vaccine efficacy of 95% with reasonably small confidence intervals. Um, and it, again, it's important to remember that's efficacy against illness. It is not efficacy against infection. Thus far, there is no data that I know of for either vaccine as to its ability to prevent infection. That will come pretty soon, but it's not available now. Next slide, please. So, um, and how did the vaccine do um, for preventing, for protecting people with various comorbidities? Here's a summary of some of that data. And you can see it really was highly effective at preventing illness in, in people who had cardiovascular disease, chronic pulmonary disease, diabetes, and obesity. And it's interesting from this data um, to me, first of all, the population had a lot of obese people, but um, obesity, as you all know, it is not, it is not good for many reasons, but it certainly is not good um, if you want to avoid getting uh, severe COVID disease. Next slide, please. Here's the data from Moderna, from their paper, it came out in the New England Journal, I guess a, a couple of weeks ago. And a very, very similar plot. Differences are that they vaccinated on day zero and day 28, as you can see the, the, here. Um, and so their data that they show really doesn't show much between the first and the second uh, dose. They don't show it. And they started counting illness two weeks after their second dose, whereas Pfizer started counting illness one week after their second dose. But again, extremely high efficacy rates in the 95% range. Next slide, please. So um, I, didn't, I was timing this because we got a lot of great stuff, but my timer didn't work. But in any case, here we are at the last slide. Here's some conclusions and some remaining issues that you might think about. So in these large scale two tri uh, trials for, for Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna, we, the RNA vaccines were safe and highly effective. And really um, it's not the usual vaccine study that gives you 95% efficacy. It is unknown how effective either of these RNA vaccines will be in preventing COVID infection, a very big question for us now. Safety and efficacy results from both vaccines are similar in different adult age, ethnic comorbidity groups. Safety and efficacy in children, something I'm very interested in, even though I'm an internist, um, hasn't been shown yet. So we have a whole series of studies um, to get to as to how this vaccine will work in young children. Of course, they are relatively less um, uh, likely to get severe disease. The incidence of rare safety issues, I, I know many of you have read about anaphylaxis. Um, there seems to, there may be an association with Bell's palsy, other things is not known. And I would just simply say, um, vaccines when they're apl applied are given to very large numbers of people. And just by chance, there are many adverse re things that can happen. And it is not simple to associate rare untoward events like Bell's palsy, for example, with a vaccination event. So that requires very good um, follow-up and some uh, fancy statistics. Um, and we, it remains to be seen um, for those type of events, whether there's a clear etiologic association. Accurate correlates of protection are unknown. For some vaccines, we have great correlates of protection. For pneumococcal vaccine, you get a certain amount, amount of antibody and you're protected against that type of pneumococcus. For hepatitis B, same amount. Amount of antibody correlates incredibly well with protection. No known correlate of protection here. And the, obviously the duration of protection is unknown. We really only have two to three months of protective efficacy here. Uh, we have to go a lot for, uh, further. Dose sparing uh, strategies are not established for either vaccine and I would hope that we don't need to use them. Um, and then finally, I think somebody, Eric may have mentioned this, the ability of COVID virus to mutate to escape immunity is unknown. But thus far, my, and we can talk about this, my own feeling from the literature is that, well, first of all, all RNA viruses mutate all the time. Um, um, the virus that is most usually we know about mutation causing escape from immunity is influenza. 
it is not clear to me whether this uh, mutation, which is happening with COVID, is a, is a problem for us or not, and we, we need to wait. The data so far seems to indicate that the mutations that have been tested do not lead to escape from neutralization. And to date, it appears relatively, so I would say it, it appears relatively easy to generate uh, a protective immunity to COVID-19. For example, it sure is very, very hard, if not impossible, to generate immunity to HIV. And it's proven almost impossible to generate protective immunity to hepatitis C. But for COVID, it looks pretty easy. These two work very well. But protection against trans infection and protection to stop the transmissibility in a person are unknown and may be much harder to do. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Harry. And uh, hello, my name is Bali Palendron. I would like to talk about uh, what we know about the immunology and the mechanisms of action of this vaccine, of this messenger RNA vaccine. Next slide, Kari. Okay, so these are my industry disclosures. I serve on the external immunology network of GSK on the SAB of Medicago and am a collaborator or a consultant to these other companies. Next slide, please. Right, so these are the topics that I'd like to discuss. What are messenger RNA vaccines? What do we know about their mechanism of action? How durable is the immune response induced by these vaccines? And uh, this issue that Harry mentioned, how well do these vaccines protect against new variants? And then most importantly, I'd like to highlight a study that Kari and, and, and our lab and a number of other labs at Stanford are doing to understand the mechanisms of immunity induced by this Pfizer-BioNTech mRNA vaccine. Next slide, please, Curry. Right. So, um, you know, I'd like to mention the fact that I think there's some feedback here from someone. If you could switch off your mics. Thank you. Um, uh, since the dawn of vaccinology more than 200 years ago, uh, there have been successive waves of uh, technological innovation that's resulted in uh, many different platform technologies to make vaccines. These are shown here. As you can see on the top left, you have what you call the live attenuated vaccines, such as smallpox or yellow fever or measles or mumps or rubella. These are effectively live viruses, but weakened forms of the pathogenic virus that do not cause disease, but that can stimulate immunity uh, as potent and durable as uh, if you were to get a live infection. Then you have inactivated viruses, such as the flu shot that we get every year, or the inactivated flu shot. Uh, also COVID vaccines being made by a couple of Chinese companies there. They are inactivated vaccines. Uh, then you have inactivated toxoids, which are bacterial toxins. Uh, and the classic example here is uh, diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus vaccines, and so on. So you have, you see, a broad portfolio of technologies with, with, uh, with which you can make vaccines. But the new kid on the block is uh, the bottom right, what we call the messenger RNA vaccines. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so this is really uh, sort of very basic, but effect, I mean, for the non-molecular biologists, uh, of course, we know that DNA is the blueprint of life. It's in the nucleus. This is then transcribed into molecules known as messenger RNAs, which carry the message from the blueprint uh, to make proteins, which are the building blocks of life. Uh, next slide, Curry. Right. So um, the key question is, how do you deliver uh, messenger RNA vaccines in vivo? Uh, and this is important in order to get robust immune responses. Uh, you see, um, exogenous messenger RNA must penetrate the barrier of the lipid membrane of a cell to reach the cytoplasm to be translated into functional proteins. So what uh, the Pfizer and the Moderna messenger RNA vaccines are encapsulated in are these lipid nanoparticles. Uh, and these have become one of the most commonly used mRNA delivery tools uh, uh, by a number of different groups. Uh, now these lipid nanoparticles typically consist of four components, uh, cationic lipid uh, that helps self-assembly into virus-sized particles, about 100 nanometers. Uh, it also allows endosomal release of the messenger RNA into cytoplasm. Uh, and 
It also has the lipid-linked polyethylene glycol, uh, which increases the half-life of the formulations, and cholesterol as a stabilizing agent, and then some phospholipids, which support the uh, lipid uh, bilayer structure. Next slide, please. So how do these vaccines work? Next slide, please. Yeah. So Harry showed some of the immunogenicity data. This is from a paper published by the Pfizer group. This was from a phase one study that they had done a few months ago. The point is that uh, this vaccine is given at day zero and then at day 21. And you can see after the first immunization, there's not a very strong induction of neutralizing antibody response. Uh, however, uh, after the booster immunization, then you see a very substantial neutralizing antibody response. Uh, there is a dose titration here. In case you're wondering why is it that the 60 microgram dose doesn't seem to give very much of a response, the reason is because there was not a booster shot with the 60 microgram dose. Now, I'd also like to draw your attention to the panel on the right, which is looking at the T cell response. You see, um, what we know from prior knowledge is that viruses induce very strong T cell responses, but inactivated vaccines such as recombinant proteins and so on don't really induce very much of a T cell response. What I find remarkable about this data on the panel on the right is the magnitude of the T cell response, in particular, the CD8 T cell response. So this highlights the fact that these messenger RNA vaccines perhaps could be inducing some CD8 T cell response much higher than what's been seen previously with inactivated vaccines. Uh, whether they are as good as live viral vaccines remains to be seen. Next slide, please. Right. Now, when you inject messenger RNA vaccines into a person, how does the immune system sense that there's a vaccine? Now, um, you know, there's been a revolution in immunology, and this was uh, recognized by the awarding of the Nobel Prize to Ralph Steinman and to Bruce Beutler and to Jules Hoffman uh, several years ago for the discovery of dendritic cells and toll-like receptors. Next slide, please, Kari. And yeah, so dendritic cells are the cells that initiate an immune response. They are the cells that can sense uh, a virus or a vaccine when it enters the body. And these molecules on the surface of these cells and inside the cell in endosomal compartments or in the cytosol are able to recognize components of a virus or a bacterium and thereby activate the cell to launch an immune response. Next slide, please, sorry. Right, now, um, one of the interesting features of this messenger RNA platform is that there are many structural uh, modifications that allow this platform to be efficiently trans transcribed and translated and to induce an immune response. Some of these are shown here. So you have the five prime cap. Uh, this enhances binding to ribosomes and allows more efficient translation. You have the five prime, three prime untranslated regions that allow, and the polyadelation tail that allows in, uh, greater stability. Importantly, uh, it also allows for a modification of a nucleoside. In particular, the uridine is in fact modified to one methyl pseudouridine. And the purpose of that modification is to prevent excessive activation of these innate sensing molecules by this mRNA platform. That might seem paradoxical because if you're trying to evoke an immune response, why would you do this modification such that the there was less innate activation, but I'll come back to this point on the next slide. The other, uh, if you go back one more slide, sorry, just go back once. Yeah. Sorry, previous, previous this one. Yeah, thank you. The other point here is that the double stranded RNAs, which are uh, sometimes found as contaminants in these in vitro transcribed messenger RNAs are removed by uh, FPLC or HPLC. Uh, and the reason for removing that, next slide, is again to prevent excessive activation of these innate sensing receptors. So you see here, it's a, it's a, it's a cartoon of a dendritic cell. On the left uh, is the situation where you would have uh, messenger RNAs, which are not modified along the lines that I mentioned in the previous slide. So in other words, you do have contaminating double-stranded RNAs that can activate 
molecules in the cytoplasm known as Rig I uh, or, or TLR3 in the endosomes. Uh, you also have single-stranded messenger RNA, which, which uh, with the with the uridine, without the uridine modification, that can activate toll-like receptor seven. All of that leads to efficient activation of dendritic cells. So why is that a bad thing? Why do they go to all these excessive trouble of modifying this. The reason is some of these activation pathway, in particular protein kinase R, can completely shut off translation of the messenger RNA into protein. And you need to get translation to get a high enough quantity of protein. And so that's what happens on the right-hand side of this uh, uh, diagram there. Next slide. Right, so this is effectively what I've mentioned to you. The messenger RNA gets into these dendritic cells, it gets processed and then presented to these T cells. And then the T cells then help B cells to make neutralizing antibodies. Uh, and then you do also get some cytotoxic T cell priming. Next slide. Now, a big puzzle is uh, based on what I've told you that there are all these modifications that prevent uh, triggering of these innate sensing receptors, how on earth does this vaccine work? How does this messenger RNA stimulate? And that's something that we and a number of others hope to work on. Uh, and then the third question is how durable is protective immune responses? Let me give you some context. If you look at the history of vaccines and if you ask how durable are vaccine responses to any vaccine. So here, here's the data. Smallpox can induce lifelong immunity in the majority of people. All these live viral vaccines can really give you lifelong immunity or pretty much lifelong immunity that lasts for several decades. On the other hand, next slide, there are many vaccines for which uh, durable immunity, achieving durable immunity is a problem, such as the seasonal flu shot. You know, the seasonal flu shot only gives you immunity for a few months. Uh, and in fact, these bone marrow plasma cells that produce antibodies, uh, really the half-life is very low. Uh, pertussis, this is another major problem as well. So what do we know about the immune uh, durability for mRNA vaccines? Next slide. The only data that we have available was published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine, and that's up to what, day 115. Uh, and here you can look at the neutralization assays in these different age groups, the, the between 16 and um, 35, 35 to 17, 75 and older. And by and large, you can see that up to 115, uh, the decay rate seems to be fairly good. So that's encouraging, uh, but it's still early days and it remains to be seen how persistent these responses are. Next slide. Now, this issue Carrie raised. Uh, so you're seeing these variants. What is the likelihood that these vaccines are going to Pre uh, prevent infection or, or protect against these uh, new variants? Well, the first point to make is that variants will surely continue to emerge. The classic example was shown here where, you know, back in February or earlier, we had the D614 strain, which was the dominant strain, but then the mutation to the uh, to, uh, uh, the, the D614G strain resulted and, and very soon that became the dominant strain so that today there's been this global transition in which this is the predominant circulating strain. Next slide. And in fact, what that single point mutation does is to make the spike protein, make it looser. And it really opens up the, uh, this, uh, the, the, region, the, the region at the top here that binds to the ACE receptor. And in this open conformation, there can be enhanced affinity for the ACE receptor. And therefore this strain is much more transmissible. Next slide, please. Now, and the next slide. Now, if you look at all the mutations that have been described on the spike protein of this virus, these are shown here. Uh, in particular, if you look at the top right at the receptor binding domain, that is the domain that binds to the ACE receptor. And you can see in blue color, those are the mutations that have been described in the variant that's emerged in South Africa. That is in the receptor binding domain. Uh, in red are the mutations that have occurred in the UK strain. In pink, uh, you can see the 501 mutation in pink in the receptor binding domain. Uh, is in fact a mutation that is common to the South Africa strain and the UK strain. Now there is some data from Pfizer that indicates that the Pfizer vaccine is able to neutralize uh, a pseudovirus that has a point mutation, uh, this 501 point mutation, which would suggest that the UK strain could be neutralizable. 
however, it's important to highlight that the UK virus, in fact, has eight mutations in the spike, pro spike protein, only one of which was contained in the mutant virus that was tested by the Pfizer uh, company. Uh, as in the case of South Africa, the data is yet to emerge. So it's entirely possible that other mutations, it, not only is it possible, but it's definitely for sure that other mutations will emerge. And it's entirely possible that there may be some escape variants that emerge, but the data is still not there yet to make that statement. Next point. And then finally, in the, in the one minute, I'd like to highlight the study that we uh, are doing together with Kari and a number of other labs. Uh, and this is really to use the tools of systems biology to understand how the, uh, the immune responses uh, are mediated to vaccination. And uh, this was a study that we had done several years ago with another RNA virus vaccine. In fact, this is a live virus, also a single-stranded messenger RNA vaccine, also encapsulated in a lipid nanoparticle, also 100 nanometers. It's the live yellow fever vaccine, which was made 80 years ago. Uh, and has been immunized, has been used in 600 million people. One of the most effective vaccines, 99% efficacious. So about 12 years ago, we decided to do a study in human where we immunized people, healthy people with this vaccine, collected blood samples at all these different time points, and then um, analyzed the immune response using the tools of systems biology. We, we analyzed the change in gene expression profiles, and then asked the question, the early innate response at day one, day three, day seven, to what extent does that correlate with the ensuing T cell response or the antibody response? And can you work out a, bio, a, a computation, a signature of gene expression that would predict the magnitude of the T and B cell response in an independent trial? Next slide, Kari. And that's what we saw amazing innate signatures. You see very early at day one, day three, day seven, even uh, as a few at day 21, all these interferon stimulated genes, as you might expect, it's a live virus that's stimulating this strong interferon pathway. Next slide, Kari. Since then, we and a number of others have in fact extended this approach to using a broad array of omics technology shown here to probe immune responses to vaccines. Next slide. And so this is the study that we're doing with Kari and, and a number of other labs indicated on this slide with the mRNA vaccine from Pfizer, but hopefully also with other vaccines, other COVID vaccines that will be generated. So we're very excited about this study. Uh, and uh, hopefully this would yield some mechanistic insights into how this vaccine is working. So thank you. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Bali. That was fantastic. I'll go very fast so that we can leave some time for questions. These are my disclosures. And the good review over um, the assessing the reactions to the mRNA vaccines came out in the New England Journal by Drs. Cassells and Phillips. And this is very similar to other vaccine reactions. They include immediate as well as delayed reactions to vaccines. And we've seen some of them here at Stanford. And because of different components of these vaccines, for any vaccine, again, there are Ig mediated and non Ig mediated events and non immune events as well, vasovagal, and then delayed events, for example, site reactions, urticarious serum sickness, complement activation, fever, and some rare skin and neurological sequelae. And importantly, as uh, Bali had mentioned, there's mRNA and lipid nanoparticles and PEG-2000 with a lipid conjugate attached to the outside of this micelle lipid nanoparticle to be able to enable the stability of the mRNA. So a lot of people are wondering what's inducing some of these very rare side effects within the mRNA vaccines. And just like any vaccine reaction, one needs to take a detailed history. And I also would highly recommend to be able to discern an IgE mediated versus a non IgE mediated reaction. Please obtain a serum tryptase for anyone that is having a reaction to the vaccine that you suspect could have an allergic reaction. Serum tryptase levels, complement activation assays of CH50, are very helpful to distinguish IgE-mediated versus non-IgE-mediated events. And that's very important as we talk about how to manage the vaccines. Mechanistic assessments, I'm hopefully going to be able to work with the vaccine and components to be able to understand ex vivo to what extent we have IgE-mediated and non-IgE-mediated events occurring in these side effect profiles that we're seeing rarely with the mRNA vaccines. I just wanna point out again, or Many clinicians, it's important to know that anaphylaxis is defined as involving more than two organ systems, for example, skin and nose or respiratory system and skin or respiratory and GI symptoms. 
You can see some of the symptoms here, but importantly, they occur usually between 15 to 30 minutes. In the mRNA vaccines, as well as other vaccines, they can occur within two minutes to almost three hours later. So it's important to know these symptoms. And why is it important to know these symptoms of allergic reactions compared to vasovagal or other side effects? And that's because patients should not receive the second dose if they've actually had an allergic reaction to the first dose or to any other vaccine that includes PEG or polysorbate, which is another component to the vaccine. Vasovagal reactions are typically 15 minutes. People feel diaphoretic, warm and cold. There's dizziness, there's anxiety as well. There's typically hypotension, bradycardia, similar to an allergic reaction, but again, those tryptase levels and complement levels can help you discern from a laboratory's perspective these two different reactions. And then for vaccine side effects, local and systemic reactions, they can occur within one to three days. These are non-IgE mediated side effects. And you can often see fevers, chills, fatigue, neurological symptoms. We've seen some in rarely in the cases of the mRNA vaccine. And again, those people can obtain the second dose of the vaccine. I just want to put this into perspective with what is the overall anaphylaxis rate with other vaccines? This is an article that was published in 2016. They reviewed charts from 2009 to 2011. Over 25 million doses were given and 33 were confirmed in terms of anaphylaxis. You can see there the rabies, which was the most frequent, to the typical vaccine being about 1.3 out of a million doses of vaccine. So a lot of you might have read in the media some of the reactions that have occurred initially in the mRNA vaccine but I want to make sure that all of us take the perspective of the fact that reporting is still going on. It's important to know that these reactions did occur. They occurred rarely. Some patients did require epinephrine injections. Most of these people did have a history of allergies or anaphylaxis, however, some did not. And importantly, not everyone with severe allergy history had a reaction to the vaccine. Here's a case of a Twitter that occurred in one of the allergic pediatricians in which she had no reaction to the vaccine at all. And to keep that into perspective, reaction rates right now for the mRNA vaccines are about 11 cases per 1 million globally. And compared to antibiotics, the rate is much higher in antibiotics. For example, 0.3% of the population will develop anaphylaxis over their lifetime. Documentation of these reactions is very important. And I would urge all of you to help your patients and healthcare workers look at the text mess messaging system called vSafe, which is operated through the CDC, as well as the VAERS uh, database that we should be operating and documenting any adverse reaction to vaccines. It's called the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. This is, for example, some data that came out from December 14th to the 23rd on the Pfizer vaccine. This is reported through the VAERS uh, documentation system. You can see most of the patients right now that are reporting anaphylactic reactions are female, they're about 40 uh, years in age, although you can see the range here, and symptom onset is typically less than 30 minutes. And again, putting everything to, into perspective, it's important when you look at the phase three trials to compare the placebo that was given as a saline injection, and there were no major differences between the active and the placebo arm. These are some of the non-IgE mediated side effects that are occurring over time. This is a nine week follow-up that was presented to the FDA with the Moderna phase three trial. And importantly, as we think about management, you can proceed with the vaccination if you do have a history of allergies, including food, pet, insect, venom, environmental, a family history of allergies as well. You should have a 30 minute observation if you've had a history of anaphylaxis, 15 minutes otherwise. Precaution should be taken if you've had reactions to the vaccine before. However, it's important to be able to consider a referral to an allergist and have a 30 minute observation period as well in this category. And then finally, for those people that actually have had a reaction to the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine, do not receive a second dose. If you've had a reaction to polyethylene glycol or to polysorbate also, this would mean do not vaccinate the first dose either and refer to an allergist. So in summary, you've heard from Drs. Greenberg, Philandrin, and myself, the efficacy is highly significant. Similar sized trials were used to license other products. For example, the varicella vaccine. We're optimistic about the impact and the science that's been done within nine months has been incredible to make this breakthrough designation as well as a breakthrough vaccine for us.
In terms of safety, these are relatively rare events at 0.0011%. CDC guidelines should be followed and updated as we move forward. Safety testing will be done in these populations, but importantly, this is not a live vaccine. If other vaccines need to be given, wait 14 days. And if a patient does obtain COVID positive as a natural infection, wait 90 days before you give the vaccine to that individual. Vaccines are critical to prevention and to address this pandemic. We are now at this flexion point in time where we can help as clinicians and as healthcare workers maintain the ability to talk positively about the vaccines. Herd immunity is the ultimate goal, but it will take several months and the degree and durability and mechanism of immunity is still to be determined as you heard from Bali. And the non-pharmacological interventions should still be upholding with masks and social distancing to continue for an undefined period. And I wanna acknowledge and appreciate Dr. Grace Lee, Bonnie Maldonado and our vaccine working group at Stanford for a lot of this information. Thank you so much and I'll stop there. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadeau, Dr. Kledgen, and Dr. Greenberg. That was really great. Uh, we clearly have to get to some questions because even though it's nine, if it's okay, I might ask you to stay over. We have 31 and, and counting questions, no surprise. Thank you for everybody for upvoting. I'm gonna jump right into it. And I'll just say now the questions we don't get to answer, I will email, if it's okay, I'll email to you guys and we'll try to get some of those answered as well and follow up. But first question here from Heather, does taking Tylenol or Advil reduce vaccine efficacy? Uh, Harry, uh, Dr. Nadeau? Yes, I, I can answer that as well as if Bali and Harry want to answer. I am not aware of any data right now from the mRNA vaccines that would say that that would decrease efficacy. Okay, great. Dr. Greenberg, you were in, Lynn, any comments? Uh, I would say the same thing, no. And uh, 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 non-steroidal. Um, if you're feeling achy after on day one or two after a vaccination is a a nice thing to um, to take. By the way, the the um, the achiness after these vaccines is common after many vaccines, and by and large, it's a very minor. Um, you know, you feel a little crappy for excuse me for a couple of hours. Um, and not, not a big price to pay. Agreed. Uh, moving on to the next question, Dr. Lewis asks. What is the expected efficacy slash safety in patients with immunosuppressed conditions or on immunosuppressants, heart transplants, et cetera? I might tack on a question I saw earlier from Dr. Wheeler as well, asking about testing uh, serology or neutralizing antibodies in these patients. Is there a timing that's best or should that be done? I, I, Bali may want to answer, but I don't think we have the data. Yeah, I'm not aware of any data that's looked to the efficacy in immunocompromised patients. Uh, uh, I'm not aware of that. And in terms of timing of testing the neutralizing antibody, well, um, if you look at the kinetics of the data, uh, you know, the peak titers seem to be about one month after the second immunization. Uh, and as I showed you on the durability data from the New England Journal of Medicine paper, all the way up to 115 days, that seems to be maintained. So I would say, you know, if you want to see how strong of an immune response you've developed, I would say, you know, a month after the second shot. Great. And I do want to point out that Stanford has been awarded grants uh, with Scott Boyd and the U54 grant series uh, in Seronet and the NIH that will be testing these immunocompromised um, cancer patients on chemotherapy. I know Dr. Miklos is also looking into this as well. So we do need to answer these questions for efficacy in immunocompromised patients, and uh, those are currently ongoing. I would just add, as many of you know, if you are anticipating immunosuppression in a patient, so specifically chemotherapy and things like that, it is best practice if you could do it to get immunized before the immunosuppression. Since, Pfizer, since the Pfizer vaccine efficacy in Asians is only 74.4% versus Moderna is 100 for Asians, should this group seek the Moderna vaccine, especially for seniors? I, I'm not on top of that number, but my bet is that's a statistical aberration. Um, it would be highly unlikely that that, that, that was real. Yeah, I mean, it's also um, I, I, exactly right. As Harry says, um, you know, these percentages um, 
may be statistical aberrations, but also it's uh, opportunity driven. Um, I think given a choice, I mean, if one had the choice to get any, any either of these vaccines, I would say that you should get it. Um, I think one shouldn't say, well, uh, right now I have an opportunity to get the Pfizer vaccine, but it looks, I've heard that the Moderna vaccine may be slightly better. So I'll, I'll decline this opportunity and hope that sometime in the future, I might be able to get the Moderna vaccine. I mean, that, that would be a pity. I think if you have a chance to get vaccinated, please do. That's a great point. Thank you for sharing that. Moving on, uh, we are told the response of uh, side effects following the second dose is an indication that the vaccine is working. What is the evidence that the extent of side effects correlate with effective anti-COVID response? I don't think good... the, yeah, if Harry. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, Harry. It's a, it's a good question, but right now there's no correlation. Um, so, but it's important to know that if you do have side effects, those are expected. And, uh, and to make sure that you know that they're within the confines of vaccine efficacy, the efficacy is highly significant. So I wouldn't say that if you don't have side effects that you're not getting an effect of the vaccine. Got it. Dr. Gallo asks, are there any thoughts why we see separate curves between vaccine and placebo at about 10 days uh, post first vaccine dose but we don't see neutralizing antibodies until after the second dose in other studies. That's a good question, question. as well. Uh, maybe I might uh, chime in here. I think this is a terrific question. Uh, of course, every, there's a huge emphasis on neutralizing antibody as the primary mechanism by which vaccines protect against infection or disease. Uh, there are other mechanisms that vaccines can stimulate uh, antibodies can develop that cannot neutralize, but can do other things like other effective functions. And this is something that Taya Wang at Stanford is looking at. Also, as I mentioned, uh, vaccines can stimulate the innate immune system. Uh, so there are a range of other mechanisms that could conceivably come into play, particularly in the early days after vaccination. And that's poorly understood. And that's something that we in Kari's lab and other labs are hoping to find out in the coming weeks with this Pfizer vaccine. I would just add that Bali's answer was terrific. Um, over a large number of most vaccines, the best correlate of protection long-term, and in many it's an extremely good correlate, is the amount of neutralizing antibodies. Um, that's especially true for systemic viral infections, where it's easy, where the amount of antibody in the serum is useful. For mucosal infections, which uh, COVID is, there's not always a, as good a correlation between the amount of uh, immunity in the blood and how well you're infected at a mucosal surface, how well you're protected at a mucosal surface. Uh, Dr. Lee asks, uh, can you comment on the relative importance of humoral versus cellular immune uh, response induced by the vaccine for strength and durability immunity? If a variant is not responsive to neutralizing antibodies induced by the vaccine, how effective do you think the T cell response will be at maintaining immunity? Maybe. Molly, that's a setup yes. for you. <laughs> it was a planted question. Okay. All right. So again, you know, uh, the immune system, mammalian immune system has evolved these diverse mechanisms by which uh, the host can be protected against a pathogen. Antibodies, neutralizing antibodies work by preventing a virus from entering a cell, by binding to that site of the virus that would prevent its entry uh, into a cell. T cells or cytotoxic T cells work by getting rid of infected cells so that bystander cells then don't become infected. So these are complementary and synergistic mechanisms that work hand in hand. Now you ask about the relative importance of these. Well, uh, you know, such a simple and fundamental question, believe it or not, is quite complex to answer because it's context dependent. If you ask within the first few days of virus entry, do you want to prevent infection? In other words, do you want to prevent even a single virion from establishing infection in a person? I would say it's the neutralizing antibody because you can block the virus from entering any cell if you have high enough amounts of neutralizing antibody. Then if you say, well, some virions have slipped through this first line of defense, uh, what else do I have in my immune uh, armamentarium? 
then it's the T cells. They come in, they kill all these infected cells. So these, these responses work hand in hand and synergistically, and the mechanistic studies to tease out the relative importance of these in the context of messenger RNA vaccines have not yet been done, but that's something that should be done to figure out how these mechanisms come into play. And of course, you basically need T cells to make your antibodies. So, um, so that um, in many viral infections, the passive transfer of just purified antibody is sufficient to mediate protection. Um, and uh, the, for some infections, that's, that's very clear. For some other infections, like the, many of the herpes infections, probably T cell immunity plays a much larger role. Just to tack onto that, so uh, next week we'll, I hear we'll get more neutralizing assay studies on the variant South Africa and, and UK. So the take home message is this is important. The neutralizing assays are important. There are other mechanisms, but neutralizing, neutralizing antibodies is probably the primary and it is important to follow that. I, I would, yes. And I, I wouldn't have everybody in the world panicking at this moment that we're going to have a new COVID that is not responsive to the vaccine. Um, we have influenza, which year after year changes so that the neutralizing antibodies from the past year aren't as good as, as new ones. But by and large, all RNA viruses mutate to some degree. And in most cases, the, at least historically, they don't um, evolve to avoid host immunity in any short period of time. So we'll have to see with coronavirus, with this coronavirus. Great. Uh, we currently have 37 questions uh, more to go. Is, uh, we're certainly not going to get to them all. Do you mind if we go till 9.15, about four more minutes, and then I will email out the questions to you. Thank, thank you for sticking with us, and thank you for those who are still watching as well, if it's just a majority of people. Um, Dr. Green asks, what's the timetable for children? I, Moderna listed some stuff. I'm not sure about Pfizer. Any updates on that? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. from one minute. Uh, from what I understand, they are uh, rapidly trying to enroll some more um, studies in pediatric populations less than 16 years of age, both companies. So uh, Pfizer and BioNTech are working on that now with the EMEA and the FDA. Great. Uh, moving on, Dr. Koloff asks, how can we get herd immunity if the vaccine does not pre prevent asymptomatic infection? It sounds like that's not clear how, what level it does or does not currently. So it may get us to herd immunity. We just don't know. Exactly. How well, and it would it could be herd immunity against symptomatic infection, not. It's very hard to eliminate a virus like this, which has an animal reservoir. It's almost impossible to to eliminate it from the planet. Like basically, smallpox was eliminated because it didn't have an animal reservoir. Right. But that's not a reason not to get the vaccine, just like okay. influenza. Influenza goes through an animal reservoir. We have people that potentially when they get the influenza vaccine, they might still have transmissibility, but it's cut down. And so it's all about populational health sciences and trying to get the numbers so that we can get herd immunity as a whole. And it's worth taking the vaccine for that. Great, my great. Uh Keith Martin asks, are, is there any data on efficacy or risks of vaccinated during pregnancy? I'm starting to see more doctors who are pregnant uh, on Twitter saying they just got vaccinated. We don't have data on that yet, correct? They're gathering data right now through the FDA uh, repository, but they are suggesting to get, since it's not a live vaccine, to be able to give it to women who are pregnant. So that safety data will be coming forth. Excellent. Uh, any precautions in patients with autoimmune disorders? We've been getting a lot of questions on, along those lines. I'm sure you've been getting a lot of those questions. I think for anyone, you know, being able to look at the risk benefit, there is no contraindication of the vaccine to be given in autoimmunity. And that's important. Discuss it with your doctor, but right now there were in the phase three studies, there were people that had autoimmunity and they did not have any deleterious consequences, at least in those populations with the vaccine. Uh, can you comment on the vac vaccine efficacy after day 14 to dose two? Moderna had three cases uh, versus 30 in the placebo. Pfizer had from day 15 to 20, dose two, two cases versus 18. So this, this, this has been talked about a lot. The efficacy of dose one, Dr. Greenberg, you talked about this a little bit. 
um, your comments on, and, and the data is limited. What can we gather from one versus zero? Two? I think you can, you can, you, what you can gather is that there is some immunity of we, all we know is a very, very short duration induced by the first vaccination. But, um, um, you know, until somebody sees how effective one vaccination is long term, um, it, it's nice because you're probably getting a little immunity after that first vaccination, but I'd much rather have the second one. Excellent. Um, guys, we're at 9.15 now. Uh, thank you so much. We have a number of questions still popping up. I will um, send those out. If, if there's any that you feel you can answer, we'll send a follow-up email to our whole group uh, with those answers as well as the recording of this. Um, any other comments before we close? Dr. Nadeau, Dr. Greenberg, Dr. Lindgren, thank you so much for being with us. Um, and again, thank, thank you. Thank you. And thanks for everything you've done throughout this year. We'll continue to invite you back as, as I imagine we have more and more updates as we progress. Uh, thank you for everybody for sticking with us today and uh, you have a good rest of the week. Bye-bye everybody. everybody.